Yeah, thank you. Thank you for, for being here. Um, feels good to get together into conferences after what COVID did to us. So, um, so, so this, is, uh, this is interesting. We have, uh, um, we have a theory, we have some, uh, some examples, and we have a perspective that we want to bring in and, and kind of uh, you know, continue the conversations. We do have a little bit of AI as well. It's not unshuled intelligence, it's actually artificial intelligence. So uh, the rest is, the rest is unshuled and Satoshi intelligence, <laughs> but yeah. So uh, moving ahead, Satoshi San, yeah. So, so essentially, um, just a quick round of introduction. Um, Satoshi San and I kind of uh, have some bit in common and some not in common. So I'm also an academician, I'm a double masters, cultural anthropology and psychology. And then I kind of started applying it as, as a practicing semiotician within the qualitative world and many other things that qualitative researchers do over to Sato Sushan. Yeah, and I, in contrast to Anshu's career, my background is more like the neuroscience. So I have been doing a lot of experiments using monkeys as well as the human participants, decoding the brain activities from them and then transitioned to the industry, applying to the new, uh, to, to the, to the, to understand, deeper understand the consumer attitudes and behaviors. That's what I'm doing right now. I'm enjoying a lot uh, together with Anshur and the team at that victory. Yep. Cool. So this is how um, you still watch television, is it? I don't think so. Or let's say this way, or this way, or maybe this way, isn't it, in the family? So, um, uh, I mean, there is so much happening. There are so many marketing media messages. The platforms are different. The devices are different. The amount of time being spent of them, you know, I mean, everything is so fragmented. And hence comes the, the part wherein how do you get them? You know, they are just not there, you know, mentally, physically, every which way. So, uh, yeah. Yeah, so indeed, the dynamics of the consumer behavior has transformed quite drastically recently in this multi-screen age. So as an example here, uh, under the solitary viewing with the single screen, he's viewing primarily on the main ads and, and contents as represented by blue and purple, with the minimal channel switching in yellow. That's the traditional situation. But on the other hand, Look at this here, uh, with the multi-screen with his friend. He's switching from the main screen to the other screen and having the chat with his friend and going back to the main screen and so on and so forth. It's so distracting. And it's of course not just in the living room. It is also in everywhere, including right now. So it's pervasive. Um, so we are just like living in the age of disruption. That is the reality. Yeah, so with this distraction, the key, the key thing for us as marketers uh, or as the research community to help marketers is to essentially take the marketing messages from good to great. And that's what we are going to talk about. Yep. Yeah, the question is how, right? Then one common approach is to, is, is to focus on the emotion. I guess um, everybody is saying like that way. The reason is simple. Despite the rapid transition of the, the, the technologies, still our brains are using the, the, the very old systems that has evolved for survival. And that has evolved uh, in, the, in the age of vertebrate uh, ancestors. So it's very old, but still we are using that. And that is the reality again. And that is sort of emotion. And hence, as shown in this data that was presented by, by P&G a while ago, they have just simply divided their ads into the ads with emotion versus ads without emotion. And they have realized that ads with emotional appeal have ninefold return on investment. That's very simple, but it's very powerful. Yeah, let's, let's do a small thought experiment. Imagine, um, let's go a million years back, okay? Imagine your forefather, possibly somewhere from Africa, okay? And, um, and a friend of his, okay? They are walking along outside the house and they hear a big roar, okay? Um, they see a lion approaching. 
one of them starts to think, to feel what he is feeling and then possibly interpret it and then understand what he needs to do. The other one ran. Who do you think is your forefather? It's very clear, isn't it? The one who ran. <laughs> so essentially the point, the point here is that um, we, I mean, for a long time, you know, I mean, there, there was this understanding that this is how humans behave, you know, I mean, and Satoshi San will talk more about it, but we think first and then we feel and then we act, you know, that's how, that's, that's how the understanding was. But Satoshi San will take you through how that understanding is, is completely misplaced. Yeah. So, I mean, to start with, you know, this, this whole idea of emotions, you know, we, we all, there, there was this whole theory about, about emotions as fingerprints, you know, emotions as actually little uh, jokers, you know, sitting inside our heads. And I, and I don't know how many of you have seen this movie, but there are actually six of them in this movie, you know, and they, and they almost control everything. This is, this is the notion that is being seriously challenged and has almost been, uh, been uh, yeah, taken off and Satoshi San will talk about it. Yeah, so in fact, the emotion of the human being is not really like that. When we say fear or angry or sad, happy, that kind of things, that is happening after we make a decision according to the context. So it's not the reflection of the brain activity per se. Uh, let me explain that step by step, starting with the perception here, for example. You see the object to the right. On the top surface and bottom surface, what color do you think they are? What, which, which is darker than the other? Then I think the top one is darker than the bottom one, I believe. If opposite, then come to my laboratory and I can examine your brain. But I don't think <laughs> you think like that way. Um, anyways, these are exactly the same, in fact. It's this color. If I move this to like this way, you see, it's the same. How it happens? That's because of the context. Your brain knows how the lighting works and how the shadow works and what the border works, that kind of things that is already sitting into your brain. And using that knowledge, your brain construct this perception. So what you see here, smell or whatever it is, it is not the reflection of the external world. It is the constructed world, and that construction is happening under the subconscious mind. The similar thing can be happening in the emotional aspect as well. This illusion, it's actually the primary interest is about the size. The background creature looks larger than the foreground creature, I guess, although it's exactly the same. But here, my focus is about the emotional expression of these guys. What do you think? That is tested in the controlled experiment in the United States, and the results are quite robust. So for the background, uh, sorry, the foreground creatures, you see more than 90% of the respondents said it looks like fearful, whereas the angry, only 10% of the respondents said so. On the other hand, for the background creature, the trend was opposite. Isn't it interesting because the physical properties are identical, but you perceive differently about the perception, sorry, the emotion of these guys. So again, that's not the reflection of the input information. Rather, the, the emotional aspect is constructed by your brain subconsciously using the contextual information. The similar thing can happen into your self-experience of, of emotion. Let's take the, the snake examples once again. So when we say fear, it comes after we make a decision because we need to use the contextual information. That's not just a simple reflection of the input or one part of the brain. There is no fear center per se, according to the recent theory of emotion. Then what is the driver of the, make, the, the decision making or action? That is actually one kind of emotion, but it's a primitive one. As I said, it is like the one evolved for survival. So it's more like the approach versus avoidance reaction kind of things. It's very primitive. It is still there and we use that kind of emotional motivational signals to make a decision. And then afterward, we 
post-rationalize our emotions using the emotional world. That is the reality. So looking at these things in, the, in, the, in, in more realistic experiment, this one, I, I like this experiment actually, which is done in Newcastle University in, in UK. There uh, is, is a, a, a drinks, but it was not for free. So there is a, a price list, how much for orange juice, how much for coffee, and so on and so forth. According to that price, students put money into the box, and then they get the drinks. So the system is very simple. However, they are not very honest, unfortunately. So for example, look at the chart on the right-hand side. On average, for the first week, they paid about 0.7 pound per litre of milk. But on the second week, they paid only 0.2. And then on the third week, the, it, it's again increased and decreased, increased. Some sort of zigzag pattern on a week by week basis. Why that happened? That was not by chance, of course. That was done by the trick, done by the professor. So she downloaded the poster from the internet, either face or flowers, put onto the wall. Then every week when the face was placed, students paid more money than the flowers week. The, the, the effect is very, very robust. And important thing here is um, it's, it's really unconscious process. Nobody is thinking like, oh, there is a flower, so I do not pay today. That's strange, they don't do that, right? They feel like maybe I need to pay something, although I don't know, that kind of um, un unconscious process, that drives their decision. And then afterward, if we ask about the reason, then they say something like, oh, maybe because I was not very comfortable today, that kind of things. So the emotional construction that is coming after we make a decision and action. So to summarize, the approach withdrawal motivation, that is the primitive one, that drives our decision. And hence, in behavioral science and behavioral economics, we see a lot of cognitive biases and uh, a, a lot of different uh, irrational uh, decision-making things that are known quite well. And then afterward, we, 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 we do the, the constructive emotion as a post-rationalization. That is the reality. Both are important, but in different ways. Constructive emotion is important because that can affect the future decision making and ultimately that can be leading to the long-term branding kind of things. Uh, whereas the approach motivation drives the decision making, including the purchase decisions. So both are important, but in a different ways. That is the situation. Yeah, this is where we, you know, as that fig tree, we kind of uh, have been for the last seven years promoting the idea of doing holistic hybrid research. You know, you don't, you cannot tackle uh, answers with one part of the research. You know, this is where we kind of come together. We apply behavioral science, we apply neuroscience, and we apply the classic psychological motivation methods and practice areas that qualitative research thrives on to put them together and then kind of interpret the results, you know. And, and, and Satoshi san will kind of take you through some of these and then I will bring in and I'll talk about quickly case studies. Yeah, to start with, for example, the reflex-driven uh, approach withdrawal to the marketing messaging, uh, that is dependent on a lot of principles. As shown here for a simple examples, the effective visual messaging are typically having less than four groups of visual information. That's very simple. And this simplicity principle can be applied to beyond visual domain. For example, here, the, the data from our concept testing over time, as you see the numbers over the chart, that is the number of, 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 of uh, bread point. So simply, the purchase intention score is inversely correlated with the number of bread point, regardless of the contents of the concept. It's a bit sad, but it is reality. So it can be a kind of the evidence of the simplicity principle. Another principle is about the round shape and, uh, and, and curvatures, brain loves that kind of things, whereas the sharp edges um, um, 
sharp angles, those kind of things bring us to that, perhaps because of the chance of survival rate. And survival rate can be related to many other principles as well. For example, the brain loves social interaction as shown here. And then that kind of unconscious driver drives irrational decision making a lot uh, in, the, in the behavioral science areas. As you can see, for example, like anchoring or loss aversion or social proof or whatever they are, we have known a lot of these principles in the behavioral science areas. You can see that on the internet or even outside this room. We have the booth, we have a lot of materials related to these principles and so on and so forth. So you can get an idea from that. In addition to that, of course, the constructive emotion can support our area of, of research. So uh, I'm sure, can, yeah. can you take it? So once we have, I mean, typically, typically the way we approach um, the whole idea of, of understanding, you know, human behind the consumer, as we would like to call it, or, you know, exploring the human decision making, as we, you know, we kind of try to understand it from behavioral science perspective, from neuroscience perspective, and then we bring in the qualitative research to actually uh, explore deeper, you know, and this is where we kind of, in the area of emotions, we find these three cases, or these three uh, zones, you know, which is essentially, we have called them expression, experience, and engagement. So essentially, how can you better understand emotions expressed through messaging and communication? Um, what will unravel the unknown emotions, you know, as, as consumers kind of go through, you know, watching videos regularly for a very, very long time, let's say the shorts and the reels, or, you know, even, even the emotions that people actually experience in their daily life as they go about conducting uh, yeah, you know, I mean, their daily sessions alone and with people around, you know. So I'll give you, what I'll do is that we will end up with this with, with, with very quick case studies of how we bring it, how we do it. But essentially in this case, uh, this is where we, we end up evaluating or do kind of, you know, assessing uh, marketing messaging in the right perspective. This could be packaging, this could be advertising, this could be website, this could be logo, this could be um, any bit of visual material, even hearing material, you know, I mean, audible material, music, uh, your, your, your jingle, etc. you know, I mean, so this is where we apply semiotics. And this semiotics is applied along with the behavioral science and neuroscience. That is where the power of true semiotics come in. I have a case study here. Uh, Lara is sitting here. Lara is the one whom we actually worked with for this case study. Um, this was in her previous avatar when she was with Sing Life on the next slide. Um, you know, we actually... Um, so, so, so the idea was to, so insurance communication and messaging, you all know, is so very cryptic, isn't it? It's so very complex. You know, it's almost, almost mythical in nature, you know, and there are fine lines and fine prints and, you know, et cetera, et cetera. And which is why most of us would rather call the agent than actually read through the content, isn't it? Which is where actually, uh, you know, um, uh, uh, Sing Life came to us and said that they actually want to look at all the what insurance is doing and develop a visual layer of meaning to it. You know, do not let people read through it, but understand the content when they even look at it the first time. And this could be throughout everything, you know, so your welcome letters, renewal letters, uh, you know, your, 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 your payment instructions, uh, the websites, the social media advertising, etc., etc. And we actually ended up um, creating a playbook. You know, this playbook was actually based on neuroscience, behavioral science, and the classic semiotic based uh, human decision making principles and we created a few rules you know I mean what you see on the left hand side is one one nice visual rule you know that you have to apply to communication what you see on the right hand side is another nice visual rule you know I mean so on the left hand side what you find is essentially uh, how how the humans you know the, the 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 human stories and the human connects actually make it easier for people to to, to, to grab attention. On the right hand side, the rule that you see is essentially the social proof. You know, the fact that when you actually give testimonials, when you give reviews, when you let people talk, you know, uh, about your product and service, uh, there is a social proof and there is a kind of a feeling to, 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 to do it, you know. On the next slide, uh, this is a study we did, we recently completed for YouTube in many markets in APAC. Uh, they actually came to us and they said that they want to understand what emotions does YouTube communicate. Simple. So they have a they have an event called Brandcast that they do in every market, and they wanted to understand what does what emotions does YouTube communicate. Uh, do you know what emotions does YouTube communicate to you? It's very difficult, isn't it? Because you just watch it, and kids and possibly teenagers, Gen Zs, they keep watching it. 
isn't it? There is no stoppage, you know, and, and, and we don't start, you know, I mean, as you have already seen, we don't start with emotions first. So essentially what we did is what we call as, call as the forced viewing phases. So we actually made consumers watch it on a regular basis. Then we went into an area wherein we removed everything but made them only watch YouTube. Then we went into an area wherein we removed YouTube also and did not watch anything. And then we came to an area wherein we actually replaced YouTube and all other platforms together. And we tracked this over a period of seven, eight days. You know, we did three different interviews at three different times during that day with them, uh, online uh, uh, Zoom interviews, you know, and they were actually filling a, filling a, a, a diary as well. The whole idea was to be able to bring to surface the emotion that they are interpreting. This emotion, believe me, what Satoshi San has said, is not the starting point, is the ending point. It's the constructed theory of emotion which is in rule here. You know, so this th emotion is an interpretation of what you are watching in what context. So if you are watching with friends in the living room, there is a different emotion. If you are watching with family in the living room, there is a different emotion. If you are actually at the end of the day in a bedroom, there is a different emotion. If you are commuting on the train, there is a different emotion. You know, so that's how that's the, the that's where the the beauty of qualitative research, you know, kind of comes in uh, to actually help us understand how people construct emotions and what are those emotions. And before that, of course, you know, like always, we went to behavioral science and neuroscience and we kind of tried to pick up the range and the gamut of emotions and how emotions work. And that's how we got about it. And this is a video that, that YouTube has done uh, to convey how this changed the entire paradigm of video watching for them. Yeah. This video universe contains everything anyone can ever watch. With so much choice at their fingertips, people quickly began to create new rules of engagement and curate their own personal video universes. They do this in three ways. The first is what their need is at any particular point, be it discovery or immersion. Do they want to watch a quick video about something interesting like a new music artist or dive deep into a topic they care about? For example, Jun Yong from Korea. Jun Yong has recently picked up a couple of new hobbies like taking care of plants and watches videos to immerse himself in the world of how-tos and tips. The second is who they're with. They could be looking for videos for me time or we time. Carly from Australia watches DIY content on her own and kids unboxing videos with her children. She's doing a lot of play dates. And for Carly, sharing these moments is one of her favorite parts of the day. The third is how mainstream or niche they want to go. For some, their universe might be focused on popular topics like parenting, gaming, or music. For others, it may be something quite different. Mr. Manish, a spice trader, uses video as an essential part of his business. Every morning, he sits down with his tea to follow the real-time price fluctuations of wholesale cardamom by watching live auctions on YouTube. Yeah, so uh, this is another one, the third part, you know, which is where we called as engagement. So this is a study we did uh, a couple of years back uh, for Google. Um, the idea of, and this is, all this is, by the way, just for your information, all these are being shared with written permission. So don't worry about the fact that, you know, we are showing client work to you. Um, so essentially, this was, a, this is a published work, uh, happened across APAC markets. They wanted to understand and profile Gen Z, you know. So we actually said that, Satoshi San came in and said that, look, the brain has exactly remained the same. You take Gen Z, you take Gen Alpha, you take Gen X, Gen Y, Millennials, whatever, the brain has exactly remained the same. So what has changed? What has changed for Gen Z and Gen Alpha? And this is where we went into the fact that the right emotions and the right engagements are being expressed in the context they are living in. And this context has changed drastically, drastically, you know. There are kids who are, who know studying only through Zoom, you know. There are kids who don't, I was in India a couple of weeks back and I was talking to the mothers of Gen Alpha and they said, they said one of the biggest learnings for us or the thing that we want to take note of is the fact that our kids will not talk to us. They will only talk to us if we talk to them online. 
You know, so even if I'm sitting in the other room, they will not talk to us. You know, so essentially this context can change, and which is where we went to the cultural expression of the context. You know, how has the cultural evolution happened for them? You know, I mean, so for example, in India, uh, for a long time, you know, it was actually about displaying status. You know, and then how it has changed for Gen Z and Gen Alpha, wherein now status is actually not displayed status; it is a status update. So it is not about who you are or what you do or what you are known for, but it is actually where you are what you are doing and who you are doing it with you know that's called as a status update essentially you know so you will see i mean we did this across these markets we mapped them but essentially the point that we are trying to make here is that how beautifully when you are trying to explore human decisions and get to know the human behind the consumer you look at a few things and put them together you know there are these very very interesting sciences and practice areas that have emerged that help explain consumer behavior in true reality uh, even uh, we are actually also. This is the AI part. Sorry to bring it, but essentially uh, we have developed our own our own uh, large language model based uh, based platform. Uh, and there is this tool that we call as Emosense. It actually takes a lot of textual data and then gets to you to understand what are the emotions that are being conveyed by the consumers. And we actually found through this one piece of work that emotions exist together emotions emotions exist in cluster and they are interpreted you know there is they they are actually there in the context and as you can see here 65 percent of single statement responses actually conveyed at least two different emotions if not more you know so that kind of corroborates our thinking uh, to know more i would request you to look at your goodie bag there is a calendar there wherein we have actually shared some of the nice behavioral science and neuroscience principles with you one principle a month so so it's not too complex for you and then uh, we have these 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 behavioral science and neuroscience reference cards you know which are there on the booth you can actually take your time we use these for 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 gamifying the brainstorming process and gamifying the whole consumer understanding process within your stakeholders uh, yeah that's where we end so next time when you have when you are let's say with your spouse and you are angry just change the context think of that the fact that you are with your boss and i can tell you your anger will go away yeah. when i am with my spouse i always think i am with my boss it's it's not something i have to find out my wife made it very clear on the day we got married yeah. any questions uh, we, we can take a couple we have time for a couple Any hands up? Yes. I think you're getting a mic. Thank you. Hi, I'm Rob Foley. My company is Research Transcriptions. Um, I have a question. It, it, it seems that your studies and your observations are, and I may be incorrect on this, so maybe you can clarify, are focused primarily on obs observing the subject while they're watching something. Is, is that correct? Or do you also study, say, when they're tasting or when they're thinking, say, if they're being interviewed and they're thinking, um, or if they're tasting something? Can you uh, elaborate on that a little bit? Yep, yep. So the stimulus goes beyond, and I think this is where uh, this is where we need to get a little bit more, pers more. Uh, I mean, little b need need to broaden our, our our horizons a little bit. The the stimulus needs to go beyond uh, what you watch. The stimulus can be about what you hear, what you smell. We recently uh, we did not get that study, but the study was actually about being able to uh, to to develop a new fragrance for one of the for one of the products you know that you that you consistently consume at home and this was actually done through one of the applications that you saw us talking about it, there was a study that was done on developing a new jingle for one of a very very popular brand that was done long back almost maybe 20 years back but the entire jingle research was also done through uh, there was a study done to understand how smell and taste come together to actually create the experience before people even react to it you know, before people even started talk, talk, start talking about it. And that also was done using one of these principles, essentially. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. A couple of cents from me. There's a lot you said that resonates my, uh, with my thinking on the issue. So firstly, the subconscious brain takes 98% of your daily decisions, a genesis of what you just said. 
and a lot of that decision making is a function of the chemicals that it release whether it's oxytocin serotonin dopamine which get construct as emotions coming at the right end the other thing which i resonated very strongly was uh, obviously an element of the nudge theory where uh, people don't default from what they are in and the environments they are located in and if you want to change the human mind and human just change their environment and finally i'll keep uh, i'll always remember that advice Oh, we have one more question. Yes, let's take that. We have one quick uh, minute. We can take that. Yes. Yeah. Hi. Hi, Hi my old friend. Do you want yes. to be my co-chairman? Last time it, we, we chat together some, uh, some years ago, uh, an event in 2016, right? Good to see you again. Uh, my quick question. You mentioned um, you tested uh, fragrance and, and, and emotion, right? And uh, by curiosity, was that in context or out of context? And if it's, uh, um, when it's out of context, it means that in a very standardized uh, environment, uh, do you think it's still possible to test fragrance food in a standardized uh, environment? And the outcome is that uh, the real emotion or just So just um, this study we did not do, somebody else did it, we lost it. Uh, but I can tell you that the product, the fragrance was, was actually explored, not just tested, in five different contexts. When you are actually looking at the pack in the store, when you are bringing the pack at home and you are looking at it, when you are opening the pack, when you are actually using the pack, and when you are storing the pack. So five different contexts were applied. All those contexts in which you actually can possibly get exposed to the fragrance is how the fragrance. So context becomes the most, most important thing you know, when, when you are trying to understand human motivations. That's essentially the essence of what we have presented, you know. And then there comes the fact that there are uh, theoretically validated neuroscience and behavioral science principles, you know, which you can actually find on our booth. We have created 29 different uh, behavioral science principles and 30 different neuroscience principles of how you can take your marketing messaging, uh, yeah, many notches above, you know, so, yeah, for you to explore. Great. Thank you so much. So let's have a big round of applause. Thank you. Thank you.